Hello to all. We have a chapter on epidemiology and public health, mainly um, with a little tiny bit of bioterrorism at the end. Um, these are just um, shots just representing uh, public health over a period of time. You see a shot up at the top right, which is um, uh, everybody has gotten used to uh, face masks by now for COVID-19 disease. Um, you also see a reference to the early 20th century that I'll talk about, mention later, involving tuberculosis, uh, death in the form of a woman uh, that causes tuberculosis, uh, is at the door being pushed back by the um, man of the house, we will call him. Down at the bottom right, you see the beginnings of the March of Dimes, which was started to collect research money to fight polio. And those are children with infantile paralysis um, from the polio virus infection. March of Dimes still exists, um, but of course has no relationship to polio anymore, but still involved with um, childhood diseases and research into them. Uh, then a reference to diphtheria, another very important childhood disease, um, very much a player in cause of death in the 19th century and the early 20th century. And then you have a, um, a look at a um, biosafety level or BSL level um, three worker uh, who is doing research on something. I have no idea what. Uh, looks like a virus that she is doing tissue culture with. So, we're in the area of epidemiology, which broken down into three parts means the study about people. Dem, demography, democrat, refers to people and epi about. And here's a look at what epidemiologists do. Um, these are wonderful degrees. Um, there aren't a huge number of schools around the U.S. that give a degrees, particularly uh, doctoral degrees in this. Um, it is really interesting. Uh, there are various areas of epidemiology you can go into. You can go into um, an area where you might be sent out to investigate new an outbreaks of a disease, or you might be more in line with uh, biostatistics, if you like the math, doing the number crunching on it. I wanted to show you um, the picture on the top right, which is called remote sensing related to um, determining where an outbreak might be occurring in the future. This involves a lot of satellite imaging. What you're looking at right here off the coast of France and England is an, a bloom of algae and plankton and because some types of plankton are associated with harboring cholera bacteria, um, it could determine a potential increase in cases of cholera related to fish, shellfish, that might pick up some of these little planktonic organisms and then of course be eaten by humans, particularly if undercooked or not cooked, um, and then get cholera. Uh, an interesting area. By now, through the um, COVID-19 disease pandemic, you should know quite a few of the areas of this chapter that we're going to be going into. You uh, certainly know the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC. They have a huge website. They have a weekly 
mm, report. Um, now it comes out in electronic edition. You can have it sent to you free through email. It's called the MMWR or Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. And if you wanted to go back and look at one of the first mentions of the COVID-19 disease, you can go back to past issues online and uh, find a first reference in January uh, in one of those MMWRs. So here's a list of what the CDC might be interested in. By the way, you think of the CDC as being interested in mainly infectious diseases. In fact, that's what it was started for in 1946. It was started to um, try to get a handle on various infectious diseases that um, soldiers were coming back with, from, um, particularly from the Asian arena, from the South Pacific, worm diseases, malaria, things like that that we either did not have in the U.S. or had not seen in a long time. And from there, the CDC's expanded into a whole variety of other areas. So now you could find a report on um, oh, homicide rates in teenagers or the incident ra incidence rate of uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, um, in newborn babies, uh, born to um, pregnant women who are alcoholic. So it runs a whole gamut of various things that they now cover. The history of epidemiology um, kind of jumps around through the ages. Hippocrates uh, wrote um, a, an important piece talking about um, the transmission of disease, and this was 450 BC um, in Greece. At the time, in all through the this time period onward, uh, people pretty much thought that it were, was gods that caused us to have diseases or maybe blamed people like lepers or immigrants or Jews or gypsies. Um, some people blamed animals like dogs. Then came along and the other idea, which was a dominant one throughout uh, the Middle Ages up until even the 1800s, and that was the um, miasmatic theory of disease, which had to do with smells, with odors. Um, potentially these odors and smells carried disease, um, and it was a big boost for perfumes, obviously, if you thought this. Then we had, in the 1500s, the idea put forth by Fracastoro about invisible agents that could be transmitted person to person. He called this the seminaria disease, and semen has a root word similar to semen, sperm, seed, actually, what its origin is. And this is truer to what we have now, but obviously he did not know about microorganisms in the 1500s. Because so many people were dying of plague in the 1300s uh, across Europe, uh, people would tally the number of people that died, uh, the number of people that got better, and how to handle them, uh, what to do, quarantining, uh, came in very strong at this time. And this was one of the great pushes to develop this area of public health or epidemiology, although it was not called that at the time. And then as people started um, migrating to the United States, particularly in the 1800s and early 1900s, but particularly the latter half of the 1800s, the 19th century, where people came in um, for the most part, to Ellis Island in New York. They were monitored for disease. Um, if um, they had a disease, they were sent back on boats, or at the very least, if it wasn't too severe, or maybe they were on the downside of it, they were quarantined. They had a little hospital on um, Ellis Island 
you can still visit it actually I mean it doesn't it's part of the National Park Service it does not function anymore and uh, they stayed there until they died or they got better and so um, there were a lot of statistics that were put together during that time too wanted to point out that even though we're in a big coronavirus pandemic right now there have been many over time and these were only this is the short list that I put together because I didn't want to cram three times more than this on one PowerPoint page and as you can see um, the SARS uh, pandemic is down at the bottom and as of right now on April 20th we have about oh, 40,200 and something deaths but as you can see earlier in the 20th century we had many many more deaths from different types of uh, microorganisms they weren't well understood there was no treatment we didn't have ventilators um, so many many more people died um, the reason I have Mia Farrow and Frida Kahlo over here in case you're wondering is because they both got polio and had some uh, residual paralysis related to it minor although Frida Kahlo actually hers was relatively major some terms that get thrown about I'm sure you know pandemic by now uh, multiple countries involved epidemic smaller endemic the disease is in the population all the time but in low numbers for example flu is endemic in the population you find it in the winter you find it in the summer although less in the summer but it's always in the population outbreak a mini epidemic for example um, an outbreak of um, salmonellosis related to uh, contaminated food caused by um, salmonella contamination in a food at a church lunch let's say uh, very contained and then we have sporadic which has no pattern at all one case here one case there so a little bit about statistics I want to, I'm going to talk more about prevalence and intent and incidence rates here coming up mortality and morbidity have to do with death and illness and then attack rate when the disease comes into the population what is your risk of getting it uh, and this has to do with RO uh, which we'll talk about later so let's get into incidence rates and prevalence rates incidence rates has to do with new cases in a certain time period here's the formula for it number of new cases in a given time period divided by the population at risk during the same time period new cases in a given time period it could be um, the incidence of coronavirus within a one week period let's say first week of April it could be the incidence rate for the whole month of April it could be the incidence for 2020 whatever the time period is that you choose and population risk is not necessarily the whole population it would be the people that were exposed to the disease may or may not have gotten the disease during that particular time period so if you got the disease before the time period let's say that um, we're looking at incidence rate for April Let, but let's say that you got COVID-19 in March you would not be part of the population of risk you had it outside of the time period or if you pick up uh, the disease in May you wouldn't be included either I, I don't want to get into all the nuts and bolts of all this and I've given you an example of this down below you might look at so this formula shows you a little bit about risk because you're looking at new cases and the more it's spread and the more people have it uh, the higher the risk that other people will then get it prevalence rate by the way 
incidence rate is given as so many numbers of cases per could be given per thousand but usually it's in this case but usually it's given in either per 10,000 people or per 100,000 people. Prevalence rate can be given per so many people, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, or it may also be given as a percentage, and I've solved a problem down here also for you. Look at the formula, number of existing cases divided by the total population. Total population means the total population at least that are alive right now. Number of existing cases, anybody who has it at the point in time when you are figuring this formula. For example, if we want to look at prevalence rate on the 20th of May, which is today, we would look at everybody who has COVID-19 right now and divide by the total population and then multiply by a thousand. And this formula tells you something about burden of disease, which might be very important if you are allocating resources and determining where money needs to go. Here's a look at a comparison of incident rates in the general population and in factory workers related to histoplasmosis. If you are trying to determine if this disease is out of check and above normal in a population, you have to look at the background. Background would be the general population. You can stop here and look at it in more detail. Terms. Many of these have come up before in other chapters, so let me just point out a couple things here. Signs of a disease are what the doctor, clinician, nurse practitioner, or PA evaluates for. Could be an antibody test, could be a fever of 104 that they have determined with a thermometer. They run a variety of different blood tests. They find uh, um, pain in one particular area of the body. Those are all uh, determined by the clinician. Symptoms are what you, you, you yourself think or feel. So you may be extremely tired. There's no way to measure tired, really. Maybe you feel hot, but you don't have a thermometer, so you don't really know that for sure, and you don't know what that fever temperature would be because you don't have a thermometer, but you feel hot. That's a symptom. By now, you certainly know what asymptomatic and subclinical means. These are people that have been infected, but they have no symptoms. Etiology is the source of an infection, where it began, um, communicable versus non-communicable, person to person. Non-communicable example would be something like mm, tetanus. Um, you cannot transmit tetanus person to person. It comes from bacteria in the soil or on a piece of metal, something that is involved with a wound production. It's not transmitted to anyone else. Index case um, is the first case. Uh, for example, you can actually read about the first case that came from China now, if you want to, to Seattle, flew to Seattle, um, and that was the first, the index case for that disease in the United States. Stages of disease. Again, terms that have come up over time incubation period from contact with the organism to beginning of symptomology. The prodromal period, which is vague symptomology. Prodrome or tro prodromal means l literally before running, which means 
what you feel before the beginning of the real disease. So it could be tiredness, you're feeling hot, maybe a little bit of nauseousness, maybe not even enough to make you go to the doctor. Then the acute phase, we have the upswing of the acute phase, then we have the decline, and then we move into convalescence. By the way, not every disease looks like this. Uh, we could keep going up from the acute phase and kind of go at an angle right off the top of the chart and you're dead. Like maybe rabies, you have no convalescence. Now notice that there is a green line down here at the bottom below which you are asymptomatic. I mentioned that different diseases may have different variations of this line. This would not be representative for something like uh, genital herpes. In genital herpes, you have an incubation period. You may have a prodromal period of, let's say, genital pain or itching. Then you've got the lesions, and then they, be, they go dormant again, and you become asymptomatic. And then maybe months later, years later, it comes back again, and you have an acute phase, and then it goes dormant again. Notice that there's no time on the x-axis because an acute infectious disease would have a much more condensed amount of time than a chronic disease like um, hepatitis B, for example. Incubation periods, not important to know. I just put some up there. They can vary a lot. Let me give you a couple of examples. Hepatitis A, viral infection, generally incubation period of maybe five days up to maybe 50 days. Hepatitis B, different virus, but still hepatitis, incubation period is generally greater than 50 days, could be up to six months, much longer incubation period. Another example where incubation period can vary a lot is rabies. The rabies virus moves up the nerves to the brain. So if you're bit on the foot, there will be a longer uh, incubation period than if you are bit on the face because there is less travel time for the virus to move up the nerves of the face to the brain. By the way, that is also another reason why you can give a rabies vaccine to people, particularly if the bite is further away from the brain tissue. You have more time for your immune system to produce a response, even though you have already been exposed. Reservoirs, um, animals, humans. There are a lot of diseases in humans that are transmitted from animals and some that are not. In fact, it's thought that uh, much of the uh, variety of di infectious diseases that humans get originally came from human. Two good examples, the SARS-1 virus back in 2003, which is thought to have jumped from a civet, which is a type of small cat in China, again related to those wet markets, and the present coronavirus, SARS virus 2, that we have right now, which probably jumped from a bats and perhaps uh, an intermediary animal called a pangolin, but probably bats uh, were the original source. These diseases in animals are called zoonoses. Um, and then if we move to um, non-human, we've got um, fomites like um, a table can be a fomite, somebody coughs on it, um, the coronavirus uh, is on the table, you come along, put your hands down, eating dinner, and pick it up that way. Could be a pen, could be any number of things. By the way, computer keyboards and um, phone uh, touchpads are notorious carriers for microorganisms too. Disease transmission. Um, showing you uh, the different ways it can be transmitted. You should be able to give examples of each of these. Uh, coronavirus, SARS-2, airborne, can also be contact transmission. 
On the other hand, something like cholera, food and water transmission, but also could be contact if you were taking care of somebody with cholera and you don't wash your hands and you're, you're handling uh, diarrheal feces, then of course you can get it that way. Uh, vector transmission, insects and arthropods. So mosquito-borne diseases like malaria, insects, arthropod diseases like Rocky Mountain spotted fever, um, carried by ticks, as well as something like um, Lyme disease. And then we have parenteral, related to blood products, so blood donations, um, also um, pregnant woman to fetus, also in healthcare workers, if you get stuck by blood in a syringe uh, from a patient who could have hepatitis B, could have uh, AIDS, so there, and again, there may be um, multiple transmission patterns for diseases. So in this chapter we're talking about populations and here are three variables uh, that uh, can affect transmission. Uh, the infectious agent, the environment that the population's in, and the population itself, the host. When I covered flu earlier this semester, we, we talked about antigenic shift and antigenic drift in viruses, particularly flu viruses. Um, it may be that um, the coronaviruses can do the same thing. Um, they are not in the same family of viruses, but they are RNA viruses, so they can change. And there are many, many coronaviruses, many of them in animals. Uh, for example, dogs and cats both have coronaviruses of different types. So these shifts and drifts are associated with either mutations, which would produce minor changes in the virus, versus large changes in a virus caused by reassortment of genes, particularly in the case of flu, maybe a person is infected by a human flu virus that's going around and perhaps a flu virus from your dog. Now, we don't get dog flu viruses, but it could get into your body and it could get into cells, just doesn't cause any symptomology or problem. And while inside of cells, if the two viruses are together there, we could get a recombinant virus produced in your cells. This causes antigenic shift and it produces a big change in a virus because you've reassorted some genes there. Here's a look at um, just generally the relationship between host and pathogen. And I'm going to let you look at this and I'm going to go on. Herd immunity. I want to show you a little animation that is very good at showing this. So you have a animation here that I'm going to talk you through. There's not really much to say about it. Um, that shows you all these people in green and these are not affected. And you will see the entry of a disease in the population and then the spread from person to person. Now this is in a population where nobody is vaccinated. There is no vaccine. And the pink shows you the extent of the infection. And as you can see, not everybody will get this infection, but a fair amount do. Some people are just uh, resistant or maybe they just don't ever seem to come in contact with other people that are ill. In this scenario, we have a vaccine for whatever the disease is, and 50% of the population is covered, has been vaccinated. 
And so you see the people that have been, uh, everybody is in green, they, the disease has not entered the population yet, but those that have a double line around them are the ones that have been vaccinated. Here's the entry of the pathogen, people beginning to get ill, but you'll notice it's not spreading like it did before, it's much slower, and it turns out, I'm going to stop this, if you look over here to the right, you'll see that the disease does not seem to be spreading this way because there's a kind of a, almost a physical line of vaccinated people that block the spread of the infection to these people on the right hand side. But on the left hand side, we have a different pattern of people. People are not equally distributed everywhere. So because you have a different kind of pattern, you're going to get spread towards the left because you don't have the same type of um, a barrier, we'll say, that's keeping it from spreading over on the right. Let me go ahead and play this more. And you'll see occasionally there's a person who was vaccinated uh, but went got the disease anyway. These people in red with a little dotted line because not everybody who gets vaccinated is necessarily protected. So as you can see we have much fewer people that get the disease. So this is 50 percent herd immunity. So now we're going to move to a much higher percent of herd immunity. Here's the third scenario. Herd immunity is now 80 percent. You can see many more people that are vaccinated. Again, much better barrier. There are the infected people. It can't seem to get out of that small little area to infect some of the people that are outside of that area that are susceptible. So there's the importance of herd immunity. So let me go back over here. Let's get back over to this. Um, you know that um, there is increasing numbers of people that don't vaccinate, either their children or themselves. This is a look at measles a few years ago in an area uh, of Europe, in the Netherlands, and you can see the area that uh, where people uh, have lower rates of vaccination had higher rates of measles. Other things that determine the um, disease going through the population would be um, behavior of the population. Uh, for example, maybe a younger population that has more sex than an older population, you would tend to find more gonorrhea in. The age of the population, again, I could use the same example of, of gonorrhea because um, younger people have higher rates of sex than older people do. So again, STDs would be a big pro bigger problem in that population. And of course, human carriers that we've talked about. The environment plays a factor. Um, for example, in this picture up at the top right, um, this is in a South American or Central American country. And there is a sign that says there is Bilharzia danger right here in the front. Uh, Bilharzia, now called schistosoma, um, which is a worm, a type of fluke, flatworm, um, is um, in the water. Um, it's larva in the water, and these two boys have increased their chances of getting it by walking in the water. Transmission routes, customs of the people, what they eat, what they do. A um, good example would be the wet markets with animals in China, some Chinese cities, um, where people come in contact with um, animals um, that might be big carriers of disease in much more frequency than they would if they were just uh, out in nature. 
uh, disruptions in life. Uh, for example, the picture at the bottom was due to the earthquake and tsunami that hit uh, Indonesia some years ago. Total breakdown of water treatment, water purification, uh, food production, things like that. Um, this is just a look at um, global temperature. Um, I'm going to show you a picture uh, right here looking at climate change um, in the future and what that will do to the incidence of malaria. Um, in gold you see areas where there is malaria right now and as a result of global climate changes because mosquito populations will uh, be moving north which you see in red uh, there will be increased amounts of malaria in those areas. So to move over to um, more into the important history of epidemiology, I uh, want to go into the 1800s, which was kind of an a important time. I guess you could say it started the field of epidemiology. You're looking at London in the mid-1800s and uh, you're looking at a water pump up at the top and uh, I want you to notice the conditions, the long skirts, dresses of the women, uh, very often it was just soil that people were walking on, there wasn't concrete, things like that, rather dirty time period. Um, there were no commodes, there was no electricity, there were no toilets to flush, um, people used chamber pots, and so if we're talking about a disease like a gastroenteritis where bacteria or viruses cause the infection and go out in the fecal matter and the feces go out into the street that have been dumped from somebody's window then there's a good chance that other people down on the street are going to pick it up or the microbes would get into the water supply and then be spread through these water pumps because this is where people got water so this takes us to the first epidemiological study, um, 1855. The publication was on the mode of communication of cholera, and it was written by Dr. John Snow, who's sometimes called the father of epidemiology. And this is all about cholera. That's what he was working on. This is a small section of um, London called the Soho area. He lived there, he was a doctor there, and he started taking care of people in the area and just stayed there. And at the time he lived there, there was the beginning of the outbreak of cholera. Um, each of those little blue dots indicates somebody who had died of cholera. And the um, gold and red circles indicate where the water pumps were located. And as you can see from the cluster right around this middle pump, which is in red, that was the pump that was contaminated. It was called the Broad Street Pump. So he charted all this, he made maps, he wrote articles on it, and as a result of that, he petitioned the city, that area, to remove the handle from the pump. Therefore, people could not get water from the pump, and the cholera epidemic in that area receded. So here's a look at a couple of what are called epicurves. Um, one is propagated. For example, if you look at um, uh, a curve done for the coronavirus now, it would tend to look kind of spread out like that. Whereas down at the bottom you see a common source or single source type of um, outbreak. Um, in the case of the pump in the Soho area of London that uh, was contaminated with the water having cholera bacteria, you would have seen a curve like this. So originally the cases of cholera all came from the original pump, but then as people took the water back to their houses, it was spread to family members and friends and other people that visited and drank a glass of water and so on. But the original outbreak was related to the water itself. You need to control a disease. Three ways to do it. 
to reduce the source of infection, the people that are ill, to break transmission pattern, or to reduce the susceptible population. Let's start with reducing the susceptible population. Immunization. You immunize them, they are no longer susceptible. You don't have to worry about them. You don't have to worry about the susceptible people coming in contact with the ill because they are now protected. Now let's jump up to the top. Reduce the source of infection. You've got a bunch of people that are ill. You don't want them spreading it to people that are not ill. What can you do? You can quarantine them and keep them away. The word quarantine of Italian origin, quaranta, 40 days, because it was thought that if you kept people on a boat, this is for plague particularly, in the early uh, millennium of this millennium, uh, like 1500s, 1600s, if you kept them out, out on a boat for 40 days on a ship, and there was plague on the ship, it would die out. Either people died of plague and you threw them overboard, or they survived and got better, and after 40 days you could let the ship come in to the port, and you didn't have to worry about the plague then getting to the people in the port. Now, if you can't control, sometimes you can't control either one of these. Uh, you can't reduce the source of infection, you can't reduce the susceptible population, or maybe it's too expensive. And so you go for the second one, break transmission pattern. Good example would be spraying for mosquitoes. Another good example would be the sneeze guards that are at restaurants. When people go to get um, a buffet salad from the bar, you don't know who's ill, you don't know who has flu, cold, whatever, and you can't vaccinate the people in the restaurant for diseases you don't even know who has, so you just keep a barrier between the two groups. Another important thing that uh, epidemiologists look at is what diseases are in the population. Are they new? Those are called emerging diseases. Or are they ones that we used to have, but we got rid of, but now they're coming back again in full force? Um, an example of that um, would be TB, which made a big resurgence when HIV came along because of the large number of people that were immunodepressed. Um, an example of an emerging disease, of course, would be um, the SARS coronavirus 2 that we have now. Global considerations. Travel. Let me show you a really interesting map here. This is a look at the spread of the SARS coronavirus 2 causing COVID-19 starting with China which is in purple. And over at the left in purple, purple represents China which is purple. And uh, you'll see we're in December of 2019, and then it's going to spread. It's going to change colors as the date changes. And watch the map. I don't think I can make this much bigger. So let me play it, and you will get a very good example of global transmission. So notice it's increasing, and we're now starting to spread from China to other areas and one of those lines is coming across the Pacific at the same time the lines are moving towards Europe and now we're down in Australia and from Australia we have lines coming over the US and now coming from the left you see the lines from China and now we have from Europe coming to the United States and outgoing lines from the United States back to Europe and to Africa and to Central and South America I'll let this play for a couple more seconds. By the way, this is a computational biologist who put this together. Really fascinating to look at this. And here we are in late February into early March. You can see the dominance of the United States now. So I'm going to pause that. It goes on for a couple more seconds, but we don't need to go through that. 
Okay, so let me show you a look at new diseases. And again, I could have crammed a few more in here, but I don't know. I just decided to go with these 20 or so. Um, showing you, again, either newly identified diseases or ones that uh, we hadn't really thought were associated with um, certain infections. For example, um, look at hepatitis C um, identified in 1989. Um, you think of that as being around longer than that, but not really. Um, e. coli, 1982, related to um, hemorrhagic um, disease, kidney failure. I mean, E. coli is known, has been known a lot longer than 1982, but this particular strain of 0157 is a particularly pathogenic strain that causes the kidney shutdown and the uh, hemorrhagic uh, gastroenteritis. And you see the SARS coronavirus 2 at the top. So here's a look at uh, why a new disease may come along or why a disease spreads. Travel, I think uh, you can understand that pretty easily by now. Microbial adaptation, antigenic shift and drift we've talked about already. Um, cutting down uh, rainforests which causes um, populations of animals to spread further for food and protection and may mean coming in contact with people and people picking up zoonotic diseases. Uh, technology like a transfer of um, organs, bone marrow, uh, corneas uh, from people that had uh, a prion disease like Kritzfeld Jakob disease to recipients that then got the same disease. So there are a lot of different reasons. And the last thing in this chapter is bioterrorism. So when you think of bioterrorism, you probably think of microorganisms that would be used to incapacitate people. But you can also use bioterrorism to incapacitate animals. That was done in, during World War I. Uh, Germany used a bacterial disease to make horses ill and cause death in horses because horses and wagons were the way they cover, carried armaments and cannons and things like that around. Or you could use it to destroy crops, which would be devastating for a population. And even though you think of microorganisms as being bioterrorist agents, you could also use a toxin rather than the whole organism. For example, a tetanus toxin or a botulinum toxin, which is very potent in tiny amounts. If you're going into healthcare, you will probably have uh, some course or courses on bioterrorism. Usually they are um, given as um, continuing education units, and you have to have so many per year. History, again, I could have come up with more than this, but here are some of the key things, um, starting with um, the plague in the 1300s. Um, towns were surrounded by very thick walls for protection from marauders and other townspeople uh, who wanted to take over your town um, and pillage. And so they would use mechanisms to throw bodies over the walls like a catapult. And a, the catapult then threw the person who might have plague, who had already been dead, over into the new town, people picked up the dead person, and now we have the start of plague transmission. Eventually people would either be dead, or they would be dying, or they would be at least uh, not able to get up and fight off the marauders, and the marauders then took their time to get into the little town, and it was then theirs. So that's been known for a long time, probably before that. We have other cases all over the globe, including cases in the United States of bioterrorism.
Why are biological organisms good to use? Let me take you to a table right over here because here is a comparison of the use of toxins like maybe a botulism toxin to a chemical agent like uh, nerve gas. Uh, one smells, one does not. Chemical gases you very often smell. Um, they have an immediate effect, whereas toxins may take some time, some hours. That means that an army that is doing this can get away before they are affected. Probably cheaper to make toxins also because chemical agents are going to be, uh, are, the materials are going to cost more. So other reasons why biological agents are good low visibility, easy to conceal. It's not like you're building a meth lab or anything where you have to have a lot of equipment. Hard to trace because again you have a time period between where it's been released and when people begin to get sick. Depending on what you're using, high potency like a toxin of botulinum toxin, easy, easy use of uh, easy delivery um, maybe in a spray. Uh, there was one case of um, an outbreak in the 1980s in the United States where a group of people in Oregon took salmonella, rather a poor choice of a bioterrorist agent, but anyway, they put it in bottles and sprayed it on salad bars to make people in the town ill. Uh, that bioterrorism event didn't work all that well. Um, also self-perpetuating because if you're using live organisms they grow obviously. Um, there are some problems. You have to worry about infecting yourself. It would be nice if you had a vaccine for it to protect you. Um, and it's rather unpredictable. You don't know which way the wind is going to blow it if you're creating an aerosol. Uh, it may not get to the people that you want. And again, different ways that you can disseminate it, um, different targets that you may have, and first responders, you guys going into nursing, medicine, pharmacy, and so on, um, you're going to come in contact with these very quickly because people are going to be getting ill and they're going to be coming to you. Here's just a look at uh, some different um, agents that can be used. The, and the pictures here are of uh, anthrax bacteria. This is Bacillus anthracis in a gram stain, gram positive rod. And in the 2001 outbreak, which only involved less than two dozen people, and only a, f a handful of people died um, because it was inhaled spores, um, people who became infected got a type of pneumonia uh, that was unique for this organism and it caused an enlarged area called the this is the mediastinum in the middle where the heart and the trachea and the esophagus are located and you have a bunch of lymph nodes in that area and it caused an inflammation and enlargement of the entire area which was unique for this particular transmission of anthrax so again depending on what type of um, uh, symptomology you want to produce in people let's say you might choose one organism over another organism. Um, I wanted you to understand that the United States was not um, uh, an innocent in this. We had our own bioterrorism um, governmental uh, work going on, which uh, stopped in 1972. The CDC has a huge area at its website on bioterrorism. They categorize organisms A, B, or C, depending on how big a threat they are. And I just wanted to point out the category A organisms, the most important, uh, easily disseminated or transmitted, high mortality, public panic, uh, and these would be the ones that would cause the biggest problem. And here's the list down at the bottom. The hemorrhagic fevers, plague, smallpox, anthrax, tularemia, 
and one toxin, uh, botulinum toxin. And last, if you are interested in reading in this area, there are a lot of books that have been done written on this subject. A recombinant genetic technology would uh, enable somebody planning this type of thing a lot more leeway because you can combine genes from different organisms and uh, produce a new type of weapon that is, doesn't look exactly like uh, one single organism or the toxin. And if you'd like a nonfiction book to read that involves re the use of a recombinant genetic weapon with um, an interesting story and a lot of good microbiology. This is the book. Uh, Richard Preston wrote The Hot Zone, and uh, this is uh, one of his uh, really great readers involving um, a man who is a uh, terrorist and uh, creates a recombinant type of weapon uh, to get back at people. And that's the end of the chapter.